In today's video, I'm going to be showing you the rarest music format that I've shown so far. With some of the earlier videos I did about different formats, if you'd have searched for the name of them in Google, you'd have found quite a few links to articles mentioning them, perhaps in retrospectives of music formats over the years. But with this one, they completely skip past it. It's almost as though it never existed. Well, it did, and I'm going to show it to you, and it's called the High Pack, or is that HIPAC? It's spelled H-I-P-A-C, and it comes from Japan from the early 1970s. But since I've never heard anyone say the word aloud, I could be pronouncing it wrong, but HIPAC sounds a little bit like a Kickstarter for a hipster's backpack, so I'd prefer to call this the High Pack, although it should probably have a hyphen in it if it was called High Pack. But anyway, here it is. Here's this thing. Pack was the brainchild of Pioneer in Japan, who also managed to convince a number of other Japanese companies to support the new format. Those included record labels and manufacturers, including Sharp, Toshiba and Hitachi. It was launched in August 1971, and although it did get mentioned in a couple of US magazines later on that year, it didn't make its way to any other country, although if it had been a success in Japan, the intention was to roll it out to other territories. Now, whilst the high pack system was marketed as a compact car stereo, mine is inside this unusual and rather large shoulder bag. However, you can see in the front of here, it is just a standard car stereo head unit. Fortunately for me, my machine came supplied with a selection of pre-recorded high pack cartridges. Now, these are all instrumental titles. The 10 on the side signifies there's 10 tracks on each. The tape speed is also mentioned on there. And you can see they come from a selection of different record labels. For something that's 45 plus years old, these really are in excellent condition. The colourful cardboard slip cases show off the album artwork, as well as listing the track titles on the back. Those are also listed on the cartridge itself. You can see they're split across two separate programmes with five tracks on each, and all those tracks are recorded in stereo. And my high pack player has been looked after just as well. It looks almost as good as new. In fact, this cable here, you can see no one's ever unwrapped that. That's the one to plug it into a 12 volt lighter socket so you can power it from a vehicle. The other cable has been used and I'm fortunate that it's included because the section that plugs into the machine does have an unusual looking plug on there. Anyway, we just plug that in the side there. Next to that is a stereo headphone output and to the right of that is an antenna socket. Now this thing also has a built in aerial despite the fact the head you it doesn't have a radio in it so perhaps you could swap it out for one that did. We've got a volume control here, a tone control on the left and then a stereo balance between left and right. The right hand speaker is on the front of the device and the left hand speaker is on the back which is a little bit of an unusual configuration. Now unfortunately when I put a cartridge into it you can see the light comes on but it didn't play. That's the channel selector to move between the two different programs but unfortunately no sound coming out of this so I'll see if I can get it working. Now I assumed with the machine having a handle on it I'd just be able to pull it out of the box but that wasn't to be the case it's being held back by something inside so to get it out I'll have to disassemble this that's a divider which I can just take out but then there's four screws which need removing from this lovely plush interior and once I got those out I could take that board out and you can see inside here I've now got a screw that's at the bottom of the player holding it in place so if I undo that one I can now just slide it out you can see it just comes straight out there's a edge connector on the bottom as far as the other things that are inside the case well we've got the speakers at either end we've got a transformer and an amplifier under that silver box with a fuse at the bottom there and that's pretty much it not much to see here so let's move on to the player and see if we can get it working now looking around the player we can find that there's a model number on the back here which says GP100. I believe this was the basic model and I think it cost 55 US dollars or the equivalent of when it came out. The box that it came in has its own model number that's GP106. Anyway after I'd taken out far more screws than I needed to I finally got inside it. The top and bottom come off like a clamshell. It's a very well constructed thing all made out of metal and we can see the belt here has fallen off inside so i tried putting it back in place just in case it had fallen off in some kind of freak accident but no it's it's far too loose it's not suitable anymore so time to replace it not difficult to replace the belt in this at all just have to remove this bracket and then you can get to the belt remove it off the wheels and now i've got a bag of these so i can try and find one that's approximately the same size 
they're all assorted so once i'd got one that seemed about right it had the right amount of tension on it not too slack and not too tight you can see it's just about right on there i can then put that bracket back over the top of the wheel and uh, the bracket by the way holds the wheel in place it's necessary that it's in there so got it back in let's have a look around see what else we've got in here you can see it's a very dense object very tightly packed hardly any plastic in here full metal construction and uh, you can see there's a date there on the motor as well i don't know if it's a date for the whole thing or just the motor part but april 1972 so of course that gives you an idea as to when this was put together but yeah a very nice object a beautiful construction really and uh, much smaller than the equivalent eight track car stereo system of the era so you can see the attraction of this compact cartridge design anyway it's time to reassemble it and hope that replacing the belt has brought this thing back to life i'm unable to test it outside of the case it has to be slid into that edge connector for it to work so let's give it a go success it's working perfectly all it needed was a new belt and now you've heard your first high pack cartridge and so have i it did sound a little bit muffled there though so i've tried recording it over the headphone output but then that made it sound a little bit harsh and thin it sounds much better in person than it does on this video just you'll have to trust me on that now i didn't notice the wires sticking out of the top of this and i thought what's behind there there shouldn't be anything in there opened it up and it turns out it's got a battery compartment in the top and Look at that it holds nine d cell batteries so i went shopping and i managed to find uh, enough d cell batteries to fill that up and it weighs an awful lot more now do you think i'll get on a plane with that do you think they'll be quite happy with this thing with wires hanging out of it and loads of batteries i don't think there'll be any problem will there nowadays i think everyone's pretty relaxed about that kind of thing To understand why Pioneer decided to launch a new car audio format in 1972 in Japan, you have to first understand what was going on around the world during this period. You see, within the US, the 8-track was king. It had the car audio market sewn up pretty much to itself. But elsewhere, it wasn't the same story. Outside the US, the same infrastructure hadn't built up around this format. So, for example, you were a recording artist in France. You wanted to get your new album put out on a format that could be played in the car. It's much more likely you'd find somewhere capable of making you a cassette than you would an 8-track cartridge. And besides which, cars within Europe and Japan are often a lot smaller than they are in the US. So... The cartridge player for these just was too big to fit in most of those vehicles. It just wasn't suitable. So by the early 1970s, 1971-72, the writing was already on the wall for 8-track outside the US. Now, as far as the Philips compact cassette system goes, it had started off as a lowly voice recorder in the early 1960s. But once Sony had teamed up with Philips and convinced them to freely license the format out, a number of additional companies had been working throughout the 1960s on improving the music reproduction performance of the cassette. And by 1970, innovations such as Dolby B and chrome tape had been introduced. In order to illustrate how quickly things were progressing for the cassette outside the US during this period, I've got some stats for the pre-recorded music market for Finland in 1971. It shows that tape accounted for 28% of music sales, with cassettes making up two-thirds of that, the other third being 8-track. And the year after that, 8-track fell back to just 4.8%. So with overall tape sales on the increase, but 8-track sales falling, Pioneer were pitching their new high-pack system as a more compact, easy-to-use music cartridge for the car, believing that the more complicated cassette was much more suitable for recording and playback duties within the home. Now, throughout this video, there's been an elephant in the room, and that elephant's name is Playtape, because after all, isn't the high-pack cartridge just a relaunched Playtape? 
Well, the resemblance is uncanny. The cartridges are roughly the same size. There are a few notches here and there that are slightly different. There's been a revision, you can see here, to the way the roller pops out of the top of the cartridge on the high pack where it's more buried inside the play tape. And there's a couple of extra notches here and there. But yes, the family resemblance is undeniable. There's definitely a connection between the play tape and the high pack cartridge. So how did this come about? Well, it just so happens in 1967, the play tape format had officially made its way to Japan. It had been licensed by Toshiba. It hadn't been a success for them either. However, by the time Pioneer were looking for someone to help them out with their new cassette format, they must have got in touch with Toshiba, who ended up being one of their partners, and used the technology that they had licensed out from play tape. Although there were quite a few changes made to bring the play tape design up to date. And the first of these is to do with tape types. It's benefiting from the work that's been done to improve the compact cassette. You can see the tape is darker on the high pack and that indicates a higher grade of formulation. Perhaps a cobalt mix or maybe even a chrome tape. And despite the dimensions of the cartridge not changing, it now contains wider tape, the same width as that in a compact cassette. It also runs at the same speed as a cassette. The play tape used to run at twice the speed, but with the better quality tape formulations, they're able to slow it down and maintain the sound quality. Also, the play tape only had two channels on there of mono music for a total of about 26 minutes. The high pack has four tracks, so that's two stereo programs, the same as a compact cassette in fact it's similar in many ways of course it's an endless loop cartridge but that's really the main difference and the track layout as well because of course in a high pack cartridge all the tracks are running in the same direction whereas in a cassette one channel runs one way and one the other so you get a program of stereo music on each side of the cassette and there's one intriguing thing in the specifications. It mentions two different speeds of playback. A standard cartridge would play for 60 minutes at 4.8 centimetres a second, but there's a higher speed at 9.5. Of course, that would give a higher quality of sound. Now, all my cartridges run at 4.8. It's quite prominently displayed on the front of them on the label. So perhaps there was a range of higher speed ones, or maybe they didn't manage to bring them out. And maybe those would activate a mechanism inside the player with a notch cut out of the cartridge because there's no button to press to change the speed. And just to satisfy the curiosity of the people that want to know what happens when you put a square peg in a round hole, if you put a plate tape in a high pack machine, well, it won't play. It doesn't fit properly. It won't go all the way down because there's some parts of the cartridge getting in the way. The other way around, a high pack in a plate tape machine, if you hold it in place, you can get it to make a sound. It plays at twice the speed it should do, and the tracks don't quite line up properly. At the launch of High Pack in 1971, Pioneer stressed what they considered to be the benefits of their system over the rivals. Unlike the cassette, there was no need for complex or costly auto-reverse systems or a requirement to manually flip the tape once it had reached the end, and the smaller cartridges combined with the simpler mechanisms required to play them would result in cheaper and more compact in-car players. It didn't work. The high pack was considered too little, too late. The sales were miserable, only accounting for 3% of new car stereos sold in Japan in 1972. The sales of the pre-recorded tapes were apparently too low to even register, and it's likely that the high pack system was killed off quietly sometime in 1973. But that's not the last we hear of High Pack. After a few years, it reappeared on the market in Japan, but this time it was a child's educational tape format. The simple to use cartridges paired with a nice colourful cartridge player were used for educational activities, read along with books and singing with mother, that kind of thing. But really, this video has been part three of the play tape story, a format that enjoyed brief success as a teenager's portable tape player in 1960s America that then went on to work as a futuristic replacement for the written letter, only to be shipped overseas to Japan to fight on the losing side of a format war, but one that finally found its purpose in children's education. Now, the only reason I've been able to demonstrate the high pack format to you today is because my player survived outside of a vehicle and inside this rather convenient carry case. Of course, the models that would have been installed in cars would have been replaced after a short amount of time with a cassette player or perhaps scrapped with the vehicle itself. 
Now, when I first saw this for sale on a Japanese auction site, I assumed that someone had put this together themselves. Of course, it was just a couple of pictures, not much information to go on. It said it was broken, but when it arrived, I could see straight away, it's a proper Pioneer product. It's got a model number on here, GP106. And in fact, looking online for more information, I found one more video of a high pack machine on YouTube done by some chap in Japan very short video but he's got a different model of this machine that he's using so they've made a couple of different ones of these now it leaves me with a bit of a quandary as to what the purpose of this machine really was was it so that you could take your high pack machine out of the car slide it out and then slide it into this so you could carry it around and play your music elsewhere that seems to make sense as a product idea but then again this particular model the machine was screwed in inside and I had to remove four screws and take a paddle out before I could remove that screw so it would slide out. But once I'd done that, it's on runners. It will slide in and out very easily with that edge connector on the back. So I think that's probably the proper reason for it. But why mine's screwed in, I'm not quite sure. Perhaps they were trying to get rid of unsold stock. They had a big stack of high pack machines there and they just didn't know what to do with them. So they screwed them into these cases and sold them off. Although I can't imagine many people choosing to buy one of these over a cassette player, especially given the very small catalogue of high pack tapes that were available. So yeah, a bit of a mystery product this one, but I'm glad somebody made it and somebody kept hold of it as well, even despite the fact it wasn't working anymore because it's enabled me to import it, demonstrate it to you today. And together we can change history a little bit because if you look at any records of recorded formats over the years, it just doesn't get a mention. So I know quite a few people who watch these videos add things onto Wikipedia as a result. So it's likely to get a Wikipedia entry now and hopefully in the future people will start including high pack in their history of tape formats. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. I've been reading the script for this week's video, and we've got an issue. I don't believe it. No, it's true. It's got some pages missing. No, I mean, I don't believe there's a script for this rubbish. Well, there is, and it says here that the next thing you're going to say is... Flipping heck. Flipping heck. The problem is that we don't have enough material here to fill out the time to the end of this video. Well... Why don't we just do what they do on TV now? What's that? They can stretch out a 20 minute programme to last an hour. That is not a bad idea. OK, let's start this one again then. Coming up on this episode of The Moans. We've got an issue. I don't believe it. No, it's true. Flipping heck. Now on The Moans. That is pretty impressive. That's nothing, because after you've done that, then you can do this. Earlier. We've got an issue. That's nothing. No, it's true. Flipping heck. Now. 
This is great! We hardly have to make anything new now! And to finish off, we can borrow some clips out of future episodes! Still to come on the Moles. So where have you hidden the body then? Don't forget to like and subscribe! Woo! But if it's pronounced Betamax, how come there's no letter Y in it? And that is why you never see a baby pigeon. Hold on! These aren't my trousers. <laughs>